Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Africa's richest person says the time is right for Nigeria to end its fuel subsidy. The removal of subsidy is totally dependent on the government, not on us. But I think at the end of the day, the subsidy will have to go. But can the billionaire's latest venture help revive the economy of Africa's top oil producer? 90% of the entire world did not really give us a chance. Nobody really believed we can pull it up, but we did. On this episode of the Next Africa podcast, we'll take a deeper look at Aliko Dangote's exclusive interview with Bloomberg and why what he says about the Nigerian economy really matters. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja, and this is the Next Africa podcast, bringing you one story each week from the continent, driving the future of global growth with the context only Bloomberg can provide. And Nduka Orjimo is a Bloomberg reporter based in Abuja, and he's joining us now and also has been covering this story very closely. Hi, Nduka. How are you? Hi, Jenna. Fine. Thank you. Good. So th- this was a, a pretty extensive interview and, and some word that we got from Dan Gote. But let's maybe start with some background uh, about who he is. Who is Aliko Dan Gote and how did he get to being the richest person in Africa right now? He's an old school industrialist. Yeah, it almost feels like he's from another era. He comes from a wealthy family. I mean, he says so himself. His great-grandfather was one of the richest persons in Africa in the 1940s. His late grandfather uh, was also one of the wealthiest Nigerians at the time. His father was fairly rich too, died when Dangote was eight years old. He schooled in Egypt, came back to Nigeria in 1978-ish and started trading in, in cement, started trading in sugar and in other commodities. But it was in 2007 that he began to manufacture his own cement here in Nigeria. And and that's when his wealth really took off. But if you want to trace his wealth, I think it's down to that explosion of his cement manufacturing here in Nigeria and then his expansion to other African countries. He's, at the moment, he's transitioning into what we think is the next phase of his empire, which is building this mega refinery in Lagos. That refinery is is the largest in Africa. It can refine 750,000 barrels of crude per day. And and I think what's important to note too, Nduka, is this was a long time coming. At the same time, he talks about now is the time to end the subsidies because of the refinery that he has built. Can you maybe give us some context as to how oil is being and has been subsidized in Nigeria and why he's saying now is the time? You need to understand Nigeria's place, you know, as Africa's top oil nation. So Nigeria is the continent's largest crude producer. However, Nigeria is unable to refine its own crude domestically. So what has happened over time is that Nigeria has shipped crude oil to refiners abroad in Asia and in Europe and then has had to import refined fuel. What has happened over time in Nigeria is that Nigerians have had to pay one of the cheapest for gasoline in the world. That refined product that is imported by the government is then subsidized, wherein Nigerians don't pay the full uh, market value at the pump. Nigerians have paid the cheapest for a very long time, since probably 1970s. That's when the government first um, introduced the subsidy into into the economy. And Nigerians tend to see it as their own share of what they call the national kick. And this is government's inability to provide other basic amenities. The schools are not in the best shape. There's the pipeline water in most cities. The roads are not in in the best shape. You You don't have stable electricity. So I think the government has had to compensate for this incompetence almost by then subsidizing gasoline that Nigerians think is odd given resource that they should be paying the cheapest value for. That sort of paints the picture very clearly in Duka about how sensitive potentially the issue is. Uh, let's hear from Dan Gote on this in particular. Subsidy is a very sensitive issue if, uh, you know, I believe the problem is not only the subsidy, it is problem that, you know, once you are subsidizing something, then people will be blotting the numbers Mm-hmm. And government will end up paying what they are not supposed to be paying. But this our refinery will bring quite a lot of 
issues out there. You know, it will show the real consumption of Nigeria. We have to make a profit. Uh, we build something worth $20 billion, so definitely we have to make money. The removal of subsidy is totally dependent on the government, not on us. We cannot change, uh, you know, price. But I think, you know, the government will have to, you know, give up something for something, you know. So I think at the end of the day, the subsidy will have to go. You know, Nduka, you were just talking about the, the complexities with the subsidies uh, for all people involved, especially for the government, right? Because removing it would create people upset and uproar, especially considering the cost of living. Exactly. It's more of a political issue than an economic one. And you have to understand that it's a huge drain on Nigeria's resources. So in 2022, Nigeria spent you know, around $10 billion to subsidize gasoline. So that's money that could have been spent on many other things. And the World Bank and the IMF you know, have long called for the government to stop subsidizing fuel, especially gasoline. But it's difficult to do so. And I'll take you back to 2012, when the government of then-President Goodluck Jonathan attempted to uh, remove fuel subsidy on gasoline. And there was this huge protest. And that protest galvanized the opposition to then topple the, the incumbent, that's Goodluck Jonathan, three years later at the general elections in 2015. When President Bonatinibu came in last year, in May, he promised to remove the subsidy on gasoline and then reinvest all that money elsewhere. But what then happened was that inflation that was already high skyrocketed and then price of transport went up, energy costs went up, food price went up, and the government felt it was unsustainable. So two months later in, in August, there was a cap on, on the price of gasoline. So in effect, subsidy on gasoline was reintroduced by President Bolasini. But just to give you an idea of how difficult um, it's been to, to actually end, end the subsidy. Nigerians are still not paying the true cost of gasoline. But the government is hoping now that with the Dangote refinery coming on board, it can effectively end any subsidy on gasoline. But I think the true test of whether or not Nigerians want to start paying the true value of, of gasoline at the pumps is when we see that fluctuation again of food going up. So Nigerians are getting to the market at the time when crude is slow. When it goes up, I guess that's when we'll see the true test of, of this policy. That was a really great picture that you just painted in Duca. And just the fluctuations in this, the really the history and the story of crude and Nigeria and its effect on Nigerians. Stay with us in Duca. When we come back, we'll have more on Africa's richest man. Welcome back. Today on the podcast, we're looking at Africa's industrialist, Aliko Dangote. Nduka is still with us. So, Nduka, let's look more at the man behind the, the empire, right? Um, he talked about how he is a, a massive Arsenal fan and has been linked with the club in the past. But perhaps the dreams that he had uh, of yesteryear uh, have, have moved on. Uh, let, let's play a clip from what he told us earlier this week. Arsenal is doing extremely very well. That time, Arsenal wasn't doing well. I think, you know, I don't have that kind of excess liquidity to go and buy a club for $4 billion, so to speak. I'd rather do something with the money. What I will do, I will continue to be the biggest fan of Arsenal every day. Anytime that they are playing, I will watch. So I will remain a major supporter of Arsenal, but I don't think if it makes sense today to buy Arsenal. Do you regret not buying it before? Last time we spoke? Actually, I regret not buying it before, but you know, uh, the, my money was more needed in completing my project than buying Arsenal. So you would have bought it, what, for two billion? I would have bought it for two billion, yeah, but you know, I wouldn't have been able to finish my project. You know, so it's either finish uh, your project or go and buy Arsenal. And I think the best decision was for us to now go and complete our refinery. So Nduka, uh, football is important to many people, but maybe you can tell us j just how important is it to Aliko Dangote? 
Well, um, this is my favorite part of the show, Jen, because uh, I get to talk about Arsenal. Uh, and that's one <laughs> thing I share in common with, with Dan Gote. We are, we are both Arsenal fans. He's a big uh, fan of the North London club. He's been a lifelong supporter. And a few years back, I started hearing that he was interested in, in buying Arsenal Football Club. Whether or not the club was up for sale was a different matter altogether. But it seemed like he was serious about um, buying Arsenal. He was interested in buying the club when they were not doing quite well in the English Premier League. But, but now they are competing for the championship once again. But he thinks that his money is, is best utilised elsewhere. And he's, he's given up on all thoughts of buying the club. But he insisted he would still remain the biggest fan of the club in Nigeria. <laughs> wow, bigger <laughs> than Nduka. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So I guess on the one hand, it's a dream loss, but also, as you yeah. said, as an Arsenal fan for yourself, uh, it, the team is doing well, right? So potentially uh, good for both of you. And Duca, let's just finish on what more we learned from Dangote. Uh, what really stood out to you as somebody who is covering what is happening in the country day in, day out? What is it that, that you are paying close attention to based on what Dangote said? We learned for the first time that he's now opening a family office in Dubai and is it's going to be headed by his daughter Halima. Now this this office in Dubai is going to seek out global investments to basically diversify the group's holdings beyond um its, its industrials at the moment. We have for a while now been wondering what his succession plan is. And that gave us an idea how he sees the, the empire progressing when he's no longer here. And then the, the, the big bit for me was him saying that he thought it was a big mistake when a part of the state-owned NNPC to have dropped their stake in this refinery. The NNPC took a 20% stake in the Dangote refinery. But we learned in June this year that that stake had been cut to 7%. And he, he said in that interview that it was a big mistake for the NFC to have cut that stick. So I, I think it tells you a lot about what he sees the potentials of the refinery and where, where he thinks he's, he, it's going, he's going with that project. So to say that the state made a big mistake, taking up the full 20%, I think speaks a lot about how that would backs himself to, to really make a killing of, of the project in Lagos. It was really a wide-ranging interview and fascinating to hear from him. And Duka, thank you so much for joining us, for walking us through it, and also for your reporting today and every day. Really appreciate it. A pleasure. And you can see the interview on Bloomberg right now, and we'll also link it to Nduka's Nigeria coverage That will be in our show notes. Other stories we're watching in the region this week. The World Bank is in talks with Uganda to find a compromise over anti-LGBTQ legislation to try to end a freeze in lending. Civil rights groups are warning any leniency, though, will set a global precedent. Also, President Biden is set to make a trip to Angola, fulfilling his promise to visit the continent before his presidency is over. He'll hope to use the trip to convince African leaders that the region is still a priority for the U.S. You can follow these stories across Bloomberg, including the Next Africa newsletter. We'll put a link to our newsletter in the show notes. This program was produced by Adrian Bradley. Don't forget to follow and review this show wherever you usually get your podcast. I'm Jennifer Zabasanja. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>